All right. Uh, let me see if I can adjust that a little bit. All right. That sound good, everybody? See everything? All right. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to get the sign-in sheet uh, passed around. So um, I guess I didn't scare too many of you away um, after the first day. Um, so let's just sort of uh, recap what we talked about last time. I always like to take a, a minute or two at uh, you know, the first part of the, the lecture just to make sure we all remember. I know, you know it's 8 o'clock in the morning, so we are in Engineering 216. We are in Mechanics of Deformable Bodies, so let's make sure we all remember what we were talking about last time. And last time we started to introduce one of, if not the most, fundamental topic of the entire semester, and that's the concept of stress. The idea that um, if you take some element or some member or something and you apply load to it, when we're thinking in terms of design and, and evaluating that member to see whether or not it's safe for use uh, and what have you, it's not really the force that we care about, it's the stress, the force per unit area. And we talked about how um, you know, we have different types of stresses, normal stresses, shearing stresses, uh, and what have you. And we went a little bit into the math, a little bit into the, um, the units and what have you, just to you know, make sure we were all on the same page. Um, I, I did introduce a, a, a calculus-based definition of stress, but we don't, honestly, we're not really not going to use it very much. It's just to sort of give you an idea of where a lot of this stuff comes from. And we uh, illustrated why this stuff matters with the following example. So we did an analysis of this three-bar truss. We got all the forces in each, uh, each member, and then we uh, calculated the stress. And we had a little bit of a uh, discussion about those stresses, and we made some, some very keen observations, um, if you recall. Um, we, we introduced a, a, a term at the very end. We said, well, what, what if sigma allowable was 12 KSI? What if the allowable stress was 12 KSI? And um, based on that value, we were able to make some, some gut feeling decisions that two of those members were kind of close to that. I mean, they, they didn't exceed 12 KSI, but they were kind of close. And, and we said, you know, if this uh, truss was a, a, a bridge and it was going to carry your grandmother to the grocery store every day, you might not feel too comfortable about some of those limits. But one of those members had a stress that wasn't even 1 KSI. It was like 0.4 KSI or something like that. I, I don't quite remember. But um, we were looking at that member, and we said, well, that, that member looks like it's way over design. We can probably take that member and, and thin it up a little bit, make it a little smaller, make it a little more economical. And that was really the whole point of what it is that we're doing in this class. You know, I, 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 made a, I think I made a statement last time, but this class can be one of the most important ones that you take as an engineer because a lot of times your decisions as an engineer, your design decisions in regard to you know, the size of that gear or the depth of that beam or what have you, are all going to go back to stuff that you learned in here. And you're going to think about uh, things in terms of stress. And you say, well, that, that beam didn't really seem that much stress. We can probably make it a little shallower. Or maybe we can make that gear a little thinner. I, I, I don't know. I'm a civil engineer, so I don't know much about all that. So um, you have to go to somebody else about gear design and what have you. <laughs> all right. So is everybody OK with this? Anybody have any questions about what we talked about last time? Anything about the math? Anything? Let me know. Um, we had some issues with the pen, so um, what I did is on the YouTube recording, I tagged on a little, I want to say like five or ten minute explanation of the example so that it would be in the recording. But I think I've got all the pen issues worked out and I'll be able to do the problems on here so that when you view the videos later, all the calcs and whatnot will be on the screen. So we'll see how that works later on. All right. Sound good? Okay. Now. Um, I introduced this problem last time, but we didn't, uh, we didn't really get into it. Um, but I want to take some time and, time and discuss this. This problem in ways is a little easier and in ways is a little harder. I just want you thinking about this, this whole concept of stress, you know, load per unit area. But we're going to get into the, the, the grunt work of the math a little bit more with this problem. So um, I've got here a... Uh, a two-tier pipe system. So it's basically a pipe where the, the thickness and diameter changes uh, at a given point. Now I've got here uh, information in regards to the length of these pipes. That doesn't really matter right now. It will later. You notice this is example 2A. 
example 2b, we're going to go back to this problem, and instead of looking at stresses, we're going to look at strains, which strains are a, a term that relates to us how much the member deforms. You know, I take some table, some two-tier pipe system, anything, some pen, I take it and I apply load, it deforms. Strain is a normalized way of expressing how much it deforms. So we're going to talk about that later. Okay? Um, but, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So we've got this two-tier pipe system, and it's being subjected to two forces, a piece of A and a piece of B. So I've got this force right here where the two uh, pipes join, and I've got a force here at the very bottom. Now, at the very beginning, I know that the force uh, at A is 1,750 pounds. I don't know what's going on at B because I've got a couple things I need to figure out. So for part one, I want to determine how much force this needs to be so that I get a stress up here of 2,100 PSI. Okay? So we'll take a little bit of time with that and make sure we understand what's going on. For the second part, we're going to determine what this force needs to be so that this stress equals that stress. So um, just you know, playing around with uh, some of the different parameters and making sure that we all have a clear grasp of what's going on in terms of uh, these stresses. So everybody understand what's going on? Okay. All right. So let me get out of this. Oh. Let's go to this. Let's make sure this works. Ah, there we go. Everybody can read that? Good. All right. It's great when technology works. Okay. Um, wow, it's like 76 degrees in here. It's insane. Okay. So I want to go through and I want, I want to sort of redraw the, this pipe a little bit just so I have a diagram uh, up here for, for, uh, for reference. So. I've got this fixed support up here, and I've got you know, pipe one or pipe A, or, or however you want to refer to that, and I've got this lower pipe down here. Again, it doesn't really matter how long those pipes are now, it will later. Okay? So now I've got forces, let's see. I've got you know, this you know, axial load right here. And what was that? It was P sub A equals, what, 1,750 pounds? Okay. And this, there's also a load down here. I mean, if you want, you can draw it as a bunch of arrows as well. It doesn't really matter. But I've got that, I've got a load here, but I don't quite know what that is right now. Okay. Now, I'm going to introduce you to the secret weapon of, um, uh, either structural engineering or mechanical engineering or what have you, and that weapon is in fact a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, you know, which, whichever you prefer. I've had some folks say they were Evil Dead fans, so they preferred chainsaws, and that's fine. Some folks get the reference. Okay, we're good. All right. Um, the reason why that's so important is um, I'm, I have a pretty common example. I think I mentioned this last time. If I'm sitting here on this table, you know, sitting right here, and somebody comes over and they cut the table right here with your weapon of choice, I'm going to fall to the ground. The reason why is because there are internal forces inside this table holding me up. Okay? So by cutting a section, we can use equilibrium to determine what are the forces inside this table keeping me up. And we can use that same analogy with every problem that we look at. Now, for this problem, I've got two pipes, okay, we'll call it, you know, we'll say this is pipe one, we'll say this is pipe two, just so we're all talking about the same thing, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a section through each pipe, okay. So I'm going to have, you know, section one, one, and section two, two, we'll call it something like this. So this is section one, one, and we'll say, this is section 2, 2. Okay. Now, when you cut a section, in other words, um, if I'm sitting on this table and you cut a section, it really doesn't matter if you look towards the left end of that section or the right end of that section, the upper end of the section, uh, lower end of the section. It doesn't matter, and I'll explain why. So I'm going to borrow this pen. Grab the pen. Okay. Now you yank on it a little bit. Okay. So he and I are both applying a tensile force to this pin. He's pulling that way, I'm pulling this way. 
we cut the uh, section through the pen, we're going to go like that, right? It doesn't matter if I cut a section and look in this direction or cut a section and look in this direction. If we're applying, I don't know, five pounds of tension or whatever, he's pulling five pounds this way, I'm pulling five pounds this way, it doesn't matter which way we look, it's the same thing, okay? So, here's that back. Okay. So, let's deal with the simple one first, okay? Let's deal with the lower one. So, let's look at section 2-2. Two, two. I'm going to cut a section, and again, you can look up or look down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look down, okay? So, so let's look at section 2-2. Two, two. Man, that handwriting is horrible. I can do better than that. Section 2-2. Two, two. Okay. So, if I cut a section and I look down, what I've got is something like this. A pipe like this. I've got P sub B, and I've got, there's where I made my cut. Okay. Now, is this, just looking at this free body diagram as it is, is this in equilibrium? No, because if I take this pipe and I apply a load, it's going to move, right? Same idea with me sitting on the table. If I'm sitting on the table, somebody cuts through the table, I'm falling down, right? Reason why is because inside the table there is a resisting force. That's why when I sit on the table, I don't fall down, okay? So inside this pipe, there has got to be some upward force resisting that load, okay? Now we're cutting through pipe two, so I'm going to call that P2, all right? So far so good? All right. Now I've got a force acting down, I've got a force acting upward. So I can go back to my trusty old equations of statics and say that if sum of forces in the y direction equals zero, that means that the force in pipe two has got to equal P sub B. Everybody okay with this? I'm dealing with this symbolically for now. Okay, you'll see where I'm going here in a little bit. So far, so good. Okay. Now, that's section 2-2. Two, two. Let's look at section 1-1. One, one. All right, so maybe somewhere down here. Looks like section H. Thank goodness, got more. Okay, so section 1-1, one, one, I'm cutting through that upper pipe. And I'm again going to look down. It doesn't matter if you look down or look up. The only, the only uh, downside to looking up is I haven't gone through and computed my reaction right here. I've got all the forces I need looking down, so I'm just going to look down. So far, so good? All right. So, more artwork skills. See what I can do. So we got that. We got that. We've got... PB. We've got PA. Okay. Again, imagine if I literally imagine if I took this diagram, copied and pasted, and literally just erased everything above the line. That's that's basically what I'm doing when I draw a section. Okay. Now, so I've got P sub A and P sub B going down, and there there's my section cut right there. Now, this obviously isn't in equilibrium because if I take those loads and I apply it, the pipe just falls down. There has got to be some resisting force inside the pipe to keep it upright, and that is something right here. We'll call that P1, going through pipe 1. Make sense? Okay, same deal. I sum forces in the y direction. So tell me, what is the force in uh, pipe one? There we go. See, I didn't just want to say that. I didn't want to say, oh, well, this is PB and this is PA plus PB. I want to take the time and explain it so that you understand why I'm saying the force in this pipe is PB, but it's PA plus PB here, so that you, you can systematically break this problem down and understand. So far, so good? So that's the statics for the problem. Now we need to actually get into the mechanics of deformable bodies. So that means we need to look at stress, okay? 
Now I'm keeping all of this symbolic for now. We're going to start substituting some numbers in here in a little bit. But for now, I just want to keep it symbolic so that everybody understands you know, where we're getting these values. Okay, so stress. Now, how do we compute stress just generally? We take force and do what? Divide by area. So would a fair statement then be that sigma 1 would be P1 over A1? The force in 1 divided by the area of that pipe? Now what is the force in pipe 1? PA plus PB, right? We just solved for that. So PA plus PB over A1. So far so good? And then the stress in 2 is P2 over A2, which is PB over A2. Okay, so far so good. Right, so I'm just taking my time and defining some of the parameters, and later on we're going to substitute some, some, some numbers in. All right, so, so far so good. So let's talk a little bit about these stress uh, formulas. We've got force divided by area. Now, if you look at the problem, I mean, one of the things we're trying to determine are the forces, okay? So that's sort of, some of those are going to be our unknown, specifically the PB, okay? But one thing that we can figure out are the areas. We should be able to figure out the areas pretty straightforwardly. We've got all the diameters and everything, so we can calculate those right now. So let's take some time and look at those. Let's look at those areas. Bear with me. Okay. So let's look at the areas. All right. So we've got two pipes, pipe one and pipe two. Let's look at pipe one. All right. First off, these are pipes, right? So a pipe is going to look something about like this. I'm going to do my best. Like that. And like that. That are those are the best circles you're going to get out of me. So, you know, I, I I'm sorry. I'm certainly not an artist. Okay. Now, let me go back to the PowerPoint because I want to make sure we're looking at the same thing. So, when I say pipe one, pipe one was the upper one, right? Okay. So pipe one, we've got D1 and D2. So D1 is the inner diameter of that pipe, and D2 is the outer diameter, right? So D2 is what? 2.375 inches, and this is 2 inches. Sound good? Okay, all right. So just so I'm clear on what it is that I'm doing, this dimension here from outside to outside, that dimension was, what do we say, 2.375 inches, right? And this inner dimension is 2 inches, right? Now keep in mind, when we cut a section, again, samurai sword, lightsaber, chainsaw, whatever, we cut a section, what we're looking is, again, that cross-sectional component. So we're trying to find the area of the pipe, that red shaded region that you see right here. That's what we're trying to find the area of, okay? Now I propose to you, that an easy way of doing that is to say we take the area of the big pipe and subtract the area of the little the, the the area of the larger circle and subtract the area of the smaller circle. So, you know, take that area and subtract that one. So so we're clear on dimensions. Oh, keep my consistent color scheme. So we say the 2.375 minus the 2. All right, so far so good. All right, back to geometry. What's the area of a circle? Pi r squared. Another way of saying that is pi d squared divided by 4. Everybody okay with that? I just don't want to do the division and then have to do it again. I just like to do it all at once. So therefore, would you agree then that therefore the area of pipe 1 is pi, 
Let me put my answers there. I want to make sure I'm being consistent with my units. Area of the big pipe minus the area of the small pipe. Everybody okay with that? And if you want to sort of, you know, optimize your calcs, you can say pi over 4 times, you know, 2.375 squared minus 2 squared. Interesting. Yeah, just factoring all that out. All right. Somebody help me out. Somebody got some, some data for me? Who's my calculator person? Yeah, I'm, I know it's 8 o'clock, but I'm going to make y'all be active. I'm going to be asking y'all questions. I can hear it. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. We have to calculate stuff. <laughs> All right, so we'll, uh, we'll just say, I don't know, 1.289. Just close enough for government work. Sound good? Again, I'm not, you know, crazy on significant digits because, you know, the difference between 12.2 KSI and 12.19 KSI is not really going to affect an engineering design, really. So, or at least in my opinion, or, and, and definitely in my world of civil engineering. So, okay. Um, so that's uh, the areas of pipe one. Somebody tell me, going through the, uh, the, the, the handout, how are we going to get the area of pipe two? So you tell me. I mean, we've, you've got all the data. It's still a pipe, so we should be able to, to do the same thing. So tell me what to write. It's going to be, you know, area of two is going to be, you know, pi over four times what? There we go, the D4 minus D3. And D4 was, what was that, 2.5 and 2.25, okay. Oh, again, I keep forgetting my units. I usually try and be pretty diligent in my, my problems to make sure I'm putting at least the, the unit symbol somewhere so that when I have some calc and it spits out inches squared, you know where the inches squared or whatever came from. So what do we get for this? Somebody else. It's 8 o'clock. He's making us break out our calculators. Oh, my goodness. Point nine three three. All right. Sound good? Okay. So I figure go ahead and get that out of the way. We've got expressions for the stress. We've got exp we now have values for our areas. So we can probably go back and figure out, you know, what exactly do we need to do to get these forces, particularly that PB, because that's uh, what's going on. Okay. All right. So let's let's start handling each of these parts of the problem one at a time. So let's look at part one. All right. So I'm actually going to go back to the PowerPoint because I want to make sure we're all thinking the same thing. All right, all right. So determine PB so that the stress in the upper segment is 2100 PSI. So let's just be clear what it's saying. So for part one, it's telling us that sigma sub 1 is 2100 PSI, right? And what it's asking for is P sub B, right? All right. Now let's be clear about a couple things. Do we know what P sub A is? Yeah, that was good, 1,750 pounds, right? And we know what each of the areas are, okay? Let's be clear about that. Now. Let's go through some of our expressions that we previously derived, and let's see if we can come up with something. Particularly, I want to look at this and this. Now, it's telling us that sigma 1 is 2100 PSI, and it wants to know what PB is. We know what sigma 1 is then, right? 
We know what that is. We know what that is. We don't know what that is. It's starting to sound like a nice little plug and chug, right? Hence why we went and just, let's just derive it symbolically and go back and plug and chug later. All right. Sound good? All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, all right, we got sigma sub 1 is, we got PA plus, here, let me move that out of the way, PB over a1, right? Okay, so how can I keep, how can I simplify this a little bit? How about multiply both sides by A1, right? Get that A1 over there, so sigma 1, A1 is PA plus PB. And what am I after? I'm after PB. So take that PB, subtract it on over on the other side. So I would get PB is sigma 1 a1 minus pa pretty straightforward right just take this and go over there so that minus pa and that's what i got over here that far so good so now it's plug and chug so we say all right pb equals what sigma 1 is 2100 psi a1 what is a1 it's just one point 289 inches squared. Maybe I can make that a little better. I'll move this out of the way. Minus, what, 1750? Pretty straightforward, right? Now, one thing I want to pay attention to, let me get that mouse out of the way. One thing I want to pay attention to is units, making sure everything's consistent. I've got pounds per square inch multiplied by square inches. So if I multiply these two, I get pounds, right? And then pounds minus pounds, everything's consistent, you know? And that's something you want to make sure of, that you're not taking pounds and adding them to kips or kilonewtons and adding them to newtons or whatever. All right? So anybody got an answer for, for me here? For this one? Nine fifty six point nine. All right, everybody good? And there we go. That's that's the answer to the first part. How much load do we have to apply at the bottom to get twenty one hundred psi uh, in that upper segment? Nine hundred and fifty seven pounds. For I'll just say A and S for answer. Okay. Not too bad, right? Next one's a little trickier, but not, not terribly. All right. Um, uh, do you want me to leave this up here for a second? Y'all still need to write, or am I good to move on? Yeah, please, if you ever are still writing and say, you know, can you hold off for a second? I'm still writing that down. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Okay. Okay. Now part two is asking something a little bit different, isn't it? Instead of part two saying, you know, tell me what load needs to generate uh, 2100 PSI or whatever in a given segment, what's part two saying? Make the stresses equal. So part two is still asking for, you know, what the heck does PB need to be, but Asking what is PB such that sigma 1 is sigma 2. So those two need to be equal to one another. All right. So let's take a little bit of time. Let's see what's going on here. So what is sigma 1? Sigma 1 is PA plus PB. Or, uh, where's, plus PB over a1 and uh, sigma 2 is what? What is that? PB over A2. So just so we're clear on where I came up with that, that is sigma 1 and that is sigma 2. 
so that everybody sees that. Okay. And then it just turns into a little bit of algebra because what are we solving for? We're solving for PB. Okay. So I got a fraction. Maybe the easiest way of dealing with that is cross multiplying. You know, that times that equals that times that. So make sure, you know, going back to, to high school algebra and whatnot, make sure you're using your parentheses in order of operations. You know, we've got to make sure we're saying PA plus PB times A2 is PB A1, right? Yeah, that times that equals that times that, all right? Now, if I'm try now keep in mind, eye on the prize. I'm trying to solve for PB. So over here on the left, I'm going to expand that. So PA A2 plus PB A2 equals PB A1, all right? I'm trying to solve for <coughs> PB, so I'm going to isolate all of my um, PB stuff on one side. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to subtract it over. So that makes this PA A2 equals PB A1 minus PB A2. Now I can do a little bit of factoring there on the right. PA a2 equals PB. And if I pull PB out of both terms, I get what? A1 minus A2. Again, I on the prize, solving for PB. So I take that, I divide both sides, and I get, actually, let me write this over here a little bit so I have a little bit of room. I get that PB equals all that stuff on the left. divided by all that stuff in the parentheses. That pile of junk divided by that pile of junk. I know. Highly technical terms, right? All right. So it's time to start plugging and chugging. So what do we have on the top? We have PA times A2. And what was PA? All right. Uh, the A2, which one was that? That was the .933. All right, the A1, that was the 1.289 minus that. And we get that PB is what? 4586. What was it? Point, what is that? Uh, close enough. We'll do that. It doesn't matter. We'll say 0.3. That's it. It's not too bad, right? Pretty straightforward stuff, you know. I'm trying to, to teach a, a sort of basic fundamental um, uh, approach to these problems, and it's, it, it all goes back to just basic statics and trying to figure out those forces. And then it's, it's literally just using sigma equals P over A to its fullest potential. Now, is there a way of checking this answer? Well, yeah, we could just compute sigma 1, compute sigma 2, see if we get the same answer. Let's just see if that works. So let's go back to the very beginning. So we'll say this is the check. So, uh, yeah. oh. Sigma 1, what was sigma 1? It was PA plus PB over A1. So that's what, uh, 1750 plus 4586.3 over, which one, that was 1.289, right? And then we'll go ahead and write the bottom one, sigma 2, that was PB over A2, right? Which was... That'll be that 4586.3 over 0 0.933. So, did someone do the top one? Tell me what you get. All 
What about the bottom one? So I'm getting the feeling there's some rounding there. 49.18. Is that what everybody else is getting? Anybody else try it? Why? No, how many? Nobody brought their calculator? Oh. You got 49.15? Okay. 49.15. Point something? So. So 49, 15.7 on both of them? Okay, all right. So, yeah, you might have a decimal off due to rounding. I mean, we're being pretty fast and loose. Again, 49, 15.7 versus 0.6 or 0.8 is not going to affect a, a engineering design. I can, almost, I can guarantee that. All right, um, so far so good? This isn't too bad, is it? Not too bad. All right, um, so any questions about this or stress or anything so far? Okay. All right. Because now I want to um, throw another term at you, another uh, important concept uh, in the world of deformable bodies, and that is strain. Okay. Now, um, an easy way of putting it is stress has been a, I guess, a normalized way of expressing force. You know, in, in other words expressing loads in a manner that is appropriate for us when we're thinking of in terms of evaluation and in terms of uh, ultimately of design. Um, you know, going back to that initial example that I had where I had the paper clip and then I had that really big bar. If I, you know, apply a little bit of load to that paper clip, I can fail it, but I'm not good enough to, uh, to fail that bar. It's because the, the load doesn't matter. It's the stress, okay? Well, this, we're talking about deformable bodies. Take a load, apply it to a system. The system responds by deforming. You know, I sit on this table, it deforms. You might not be able to see it, but I guarantee you it does. All right? So if we have a normalized way, a sort of way of generalizing an expression of force, we need a way of normalizing deformation, how much it deforms. And that's what strain is. Okay? So to give you kind of an idea, um, what we do uh, with strain is we define strain as the change in length divided by the original length. It's sort of a percent elongation. So to give you kind of an idea, let's say I had a rubber band in my hand, a really big rubber band. And let's say, for instance, to keep the math simple, let's say the rubber band was 10 inches long. So I'm holding the rubber band in its intact state, and I'm just holding it. I'm not stretching or anything. I'm just holding it, and it's 10 inches long. And I take it, and I stretch it one inch. So now it's 11 inches. Make sense? What I have done is I've taken you know, its original length, 10 inches, and I increased it one inch. So the strain in that rubber band would be 10%, or 0.1, the change in length divided by the original length. And that's really what's going on here. You know, if I take a segment and I you know, stretch it, it's going to get longer. So if I you know, just look at some segment delta x, here's delta x prime. Um, you know, delta x prime minus delta x, that's going to be the change, delta x the original length, and that's, uh, that's your definition of strain. Now, you calculus folks, that should look somewhat familiar. You know, that's, we're talking about uh, rates of change, so we can look at that in terms of a derivative if you're, if you're interested. I can see you all are just getting more and more excited every time you see those dx's and, and derivatives and limits. That was a joke, not a very funny one. Um, um, so if we look at strain, again, change in length over the original length, that's typically what we're, go we're going to do. Uh, we tend to use delta a lot in this course for deformation and L for original length. One of the things about strain is that it has no units, okay? You'll see sometimes people will say inches per inch or millimeters per millimeters, but really you're taking a length and dividing it by a length, so it has no units. That's number one, okay? Number two, and, and something to be prepared for when you compute strains, when you compute strains, they tend to be really, really small, okay? Now look, take me and I'm, I'm sitting on this table. I guarantee you it's deforming, but I can almost bet nobody can see it. You can't actually see the deformation because it's really small. The strains are going to be really small, so don't 
be worried if you're doing a homework problem or doing a test problem and you get a strain of 0.000362 or whatever. That's possible. Strains can come out really small, so, so that's okay. A lot of times uh, people doing you know, these types of experiments and doing this type of research, they tend to take the strains and multiply them by a million and they call them micro strain just so you get numbers that are actually you know, usable that, that are big. So yeah, strain comes out really, really small. Okay. <laughs> now, this is a definition for normal strain. Okay. Remember, we had two general types of stresses that we were interested in. Remember, normal stresses, you know, load going like this, and then shearing stresses going like that. Okay. Normal strain would be a definition like this, you know, the, a rate of change of length. Shearing strain is not about rate of change of length, it's about the change of that angle. Okay? Now look, I'm sure we frank, we're not going to use this, uh, this limit definition very much, <coughs> but this concept of shearing strain is going to be really important to us uh, later, especially when we look at things like torsion, taking an element and twisting it. When you take an element and twisting it, you're not elongating it, you're changing its angle. You'll see later on how if you look at something in torsion before and after, it looks like this. So we think about it in terms of shear. So it's just something to, uh, to think about for later. Okay. Everybody okay on this concept of strain? Everybody okay? All right. Um, so um, what I've done here is I wanted to go back to example 2B. This is going to be an incredibly short problem. All we're going to do is say if this segment stretches uh, 0.138 inches and this segment stretches 0.295 inches, we're going to compute the strain. Which these are very reasonable values for deflections and whatnot that we'll get in this course, and you'll see the strains can come out pretty small. So I'm gonna. Uh, oh, did that not work? Okay. Okay. So. Okay, so if we look at example 2B, okay, I'm going to go back to what we did in example 2A. So let's, let's uh, I'll say recall from 2A. Okay, all right. Now, we have... Uh, the lengths of each segment, which are what? L1 is 14 and inches, and this is 16 inches. Right. So far, so good? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Just because the, the 1 was the upper segment, right? We said 1 was the upper segment and 2 was the lower. Okay. Now, I want to go back to the PowerPoint just to... Well, I can do better than that. That's going to bug me. There we go. I want to go back to the uh, PowerPoint just to make sure I was reading everything appropriately. Okay. All right. All right. So, let's read this, this really carefully and make sure we're doing this appropriately. So, determine the strains in each segment if the upper segment stretches 0.138 inches and the total downward displacement at the bottom is 0.295. So, let, let's take each of those one at a time. Upper segment stretches 0.138. Okay. So what that's saying is that the upper segment gets 1.3 or 0.138 inches longer. Okay, so that is its change in length. Make sense? So, so for segment one, the change in length is 0 0.138 inches. Make sense? So if I look at just, let's just look at this in terms of strains. For segment one, I've got the change in length. I've got the original length. So I'm, if I'm looking at that first pipe, the first pipe gets this much longer. It was originally this long. So, therefore, the strain in the first pipe is the change in length divided by the original length, which is 0.138 divided by... 14. So what is that? Point, now how many zeros is it? Two. So it's zero point zero zero. I got what, uh, like nine eight six, something like that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
So th these values, they come out small. Don't, don't be worried about that. When you look at strains, strains come out really small. Okay? Make sense? All right. Now, this second part of the problem, this second uh, displacement value, I want to take it carefully and make sure that, that we're, we're handling it appropriately. So let me do my best to draw um, this pipe system. Now, I'm going to way blow up the, the displacements just so we've got the, the, uh, uh, sca or the, the, the concepts down pat. Okay, so the information that was given was that the first pipe stretched 0.138 inches. So this first pipe, technically it got uh, longer, right? And it got longer... I guess a total amount of 0 0.138 inches, right? Okay, now what does the second piece of information say? It says the total downward displacement at the bottom is 0.295, right? So after we apply those loads, this bottom segment, it deflects you know, all the way down here. And that is 0 0.295. So let me ask you this question. All right. How much, okay, so the first segment stretched 0.138. Does the second segment stretch 0.295? No. How much does it stretch? There you go, the difference between the two. Because this is the total displacement. Make sense? Okay, so it's just, just intended to ensure that, that uh, you understand what's going on with the data. So delta 2 is 0 0.295 minus 0 0.138, which is 0.57. All right, so, and then like before, you say that change in length divided by the original length. 0 0.157, 16, and what do we get here? 981, there we go. Right, so. Okay, so again, strains, they can come out pretty small. That's okay. That'll happen. So I know it's, uh, it's uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, or, well, I guess now it's a little closer to 8.45 or something like that. Let me see. Yeah, 8.48. So um, through a little bit of material, we've got another example we're going to work on here in a little bit. But um, so far, so good. How are we doing? Uh, that, that's a, a, a coincidence for this problem. Um, if you're doing something like a... Uh, what, like a trust problem. I mean, you can get different strains all over the place. So um, that's just a for instance for this problem. So far, so good? Okay. I'm going to do another strain problem just so that we're all familiar with it. Um, this one's a little different, um, so I'm going to take my time with it. Okay. Okay. Let me get my notes out because... I actually didn't think we'd get to this problem today, but we got plenty of time, so I want to go ahead and knock it out. Okay. Uh, okay. Give me a moment. If I, if I don't organize this now, this is going to turn into a mess uh, later on, so. Okay. Now. This right off the bat might seem like a, uh, an odd problem for this course since the whole course is mechanics of deformable bodies and the first bolded word on the problem is rigid, indicating that it doesn't deform. Um, the reason why is because we will deal with beam deflections and beam deformations later. Beam deformations are not, I don't want to say harder, but they're a little more involved and there's a little more to it than 
uh, just you know, what we're dealing with here for axial bars. You know, we take it one step at a time in here. Um, but the rigid beam concept is, is going to help us out throughout this problem, and, and, and here's why. Okay? If I have a beam that is deformable, okay, when I apply load, I mean, it'll curve. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll deform in a curved type shape. If I apply load to this, it will not deform. Okay? So I want you to think about this problem in, in terms of those, you know, how this is going to behave. If the beam is rigid and it cannot bend, I apply load, all it can do is stay straight. Does that make sense? That's going to help us out uh, here in a little bit. Okay. All right. So I've got this, um, I've got this rigid beam, and it's supported by bars, uh, these two bars, A and B. Okay. Now, what happens is I apply this load, and it deforms. It deforms something about like this, right? Now, what happens is whatever this load is, it really doesn't matter for the purposes of this problem, but once it deforms, we get a strain in this bar of 0 .006. What I want to know is what's the resulting strain over here, okay? Make sense? All right. Um, and again, we will discuss beam deflections in detail later, but we got to a number of things we got to cover before we get there. Um, and, and if we started beam deflections now, you, uh, you really wouldn't like me very much. So we'll, we'll take our time with it. Okay. So everybody understand what's going on? So far so good? All right. There's my hand up. Okay. This problem really isn't that difficult, but it, it just takes a little bit of thought. So I hit the escape button. There we go. And you all can read everything. Everything's coming out clearly. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let's recognize right off the bat that while the beam is rigid, the bars aren't. So if I take this load and I plot right there, we're going to get that, that hinge action. Remember, there's a hinge right here. So it's just going to boop, go down like that. Okay? So let's look at what the bar looks like in its deflected shape. Okay. So here I've got this hinge. And maybe what I ought to do is do this. Maybe I'll draw a little dashed outline that indicates something like that. Okay, so that's where the bar was. Okay, and here is where it is. It's actually sort of something about like this. Something about like that, okay? All right. Now, I'm going to identify a couple points on this beam. So we got right here and right here. That's uh, point A and point B. That's where those bars are. They're called A and B, right? Is that in the problem? What were they, one and two? A and B. And A is the one on the, on the right. Okay. All right. So we'll say this is point A. This is point B, okay? Now let's put some dimensions on here. I know this is a little not to scale, but it'll be all right. So this is three feet, five feet, and two feet. All right, so far so good. And, and I'm gonna put here on the side just so that we're all clear, just remember strain is the change in length divided by the original length. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's look at bar B. And I'm looking at bar B first. Is The reason why I'm looking at bar B first is because they gave us what the strain in bar B was, which was what, 0 .006? Again, really small values. Okay. 0.006. All right. Now, 
How long is bar B? B? Yeah, B is three inches. Okay, all right. So, what can I do? What can I do if I've got the strain and I got the original length? I can find out how fully how much it stretched. Okay, so again, I, one of the things that I try and do here right off the bat is you know we've got sigma equals p over a. I try and take I try and take that equation and rearrange it as much as I can to make sure we're all understanding it, its ramifications. Same thing with strain. So I can compute the uh, amount that that bar stretches by taking the strain, multiplying it by the length. You know, that times that which is um, 0 0.006, Ooh, I can do better than that, times 3 inches. That comes out to be, oh, no, wait, wait, wait. I have 3 inches. It's not 3 inches. 3 feet. Ah, units. So that's 3 feet or 36 inches. All right, so plug and chug, and that gives me what? Where do I get? 0.216 inches. And if you're curious, we can take that and divide it by 12 and get 0 0.018. Maybe I'll actually write feet out so that you can tell the difference. Okay. Now, one of the things about this uh, problem that makes it solvable is the fact that the bar is rigid. Um, I'm going to draw a little bit over here to kind of explain what I'm talking about. You know, here's the, um, I guess what I would call the, the, the uh, simplification, uh, you know, the fact that this bar is rigid, that's what makes this problem so, so simple. So I'm going to draw a triangle. I'm going to draw it something about like this. We'll say that's a right angle. Okay. So what I'm getting at, this black line, it represents the bar in its deformed shape, you know, at, you know, after it's deformed. Okay. This red line up here, maybe I should draw it in dashes. Maybe I should do that. This red line represents, you know, what the bar looked like originally before it, it deformed. Okay, make sense? So this point right here, this is, you know, where B is, and this is where A is, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. So this, this line right here, I'm referring to this dimension. What is that dimension? How, how, long, how long is that? Exactly. That's how much the bar stretched. Remember, the bar originally was right here. It then stretched down to here. So that distance, this is delta B, right? So if that's delta B, what is this over here? That's how much this one stretched. So what we can do is this. That was capital F. So we can use the fact that we know this deformation and the fact that this bar is rigid to say, well, this is just a triangle. We can use slope ratios. We can compute this pretty easily. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to use slope ratios by saying the following. Would you agree that delta B is to 3 feet as delta A is to 8 feet. Because here's what I'm doing. I'm saying this is to this as this is to this. That's just fundamental trig, right? Mm -hmm. You all have seen that stuff before. So I can use this expression to determine what delta A is. Pretty straightforward. So. And I did that without 
doing an inverse tangent to get a, a, a angle and then sines and cosines. I just looked at it basically. All right, so delta A is 8 feet, 3 feet, delta B. Do I need to worry about units inside that fraction? No, they cancel, right? So that cancels and that cancels. Take that and multiply it by whatever uh, value I think makes sense. Maybe I'll use the inches one. And I'll say 8 thirds times 0 0.216. And I get what? And there you go, right? Inches, right? Not too bad, right? Now, what was the problem asking? It was asking for the strain in A, right? What is this? This is the change in length. This is how much A stretched, okay? This is the change in length. What's the original length of A? Four feet or it's four feet. 48 inches, 4 times 12, right? So if I look at bar A, delta A is 0 0.576. Length of A is 48 inches. Therefore, the strain is the change in length divided by the original length. What do we get? And there we go. Not too bad, right? It's really isn't that bad. Again, I'm trying to take those equations and sort of, you know, put them through the ringer, rearrange them, make you compute the, the lengths or the strains or the, the deformations or you know, make you back calculate the loads or back calculate the areas. I'm taking these equations and rearranging them as many ways as possible so that you understand them. I mean, I know the equations are pretty simple, but it's all about your understanding and being able to connect the equations with the real life situations. Okay. So, anybody have any questions? Anything? Anything hazy at all? All right. Um, so, he here's what's, what's going to happen. Do I need to leave this up for a little bit? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No problem. Yes. Well, okay, that's a good question. Strain doesn't really, it doesn't have, it doesn't have any units. Oh, uh, yeah, I would say inches. I mean, if we're dealing in metric, probably millimeters. Um, really, the, the, you know, as long as you're getting the correct quantity, I guess technically the units don't matter. But, but think about it like this. Um, if I'm trying to express how much this table deflects under my weight, I wouldn't express it in miles. You, you see what I mean? Inches make sense because it's a relatively small, understandable quantity. If we were in metric, we'd probably do millimeters. So it doesn't matter as long as, you know, the only, the only point I would make is just make sure you're being consistent, that you're not taking 0.576 inches and dividing it by four feet. As long as that's the case, you can really use whatever units you want. That, everybody else good? I mean, those are good questions, and, and I will stop and make sure that every question is, is explained as best as, as, as I can humanly possibly do so. So, everybody good? Okay. Um, now, I'm curious, how many of you are in Engineering 215 or have already taken it? Okay. What's that? Materials. Yeah. Okay. So, some of this stuff that's going to come up next, and I'm probably going to hold off and, and discuss this in greater detail next week on Tuesday, but it's the concept of stress-strain relationships. Probably in that course, you will conduct a tensile test. 
If you take civil engineering materials, CE 321, I know that you definitely do that. I know Professor Huffman has you do a, a tensile test. But the reason why th this is important is because we've, so far what we've been trying to do, uh, I guess the best way of putting it, is trying to break down the geometry of a given problem. You know, we take force and we divide it by area to get a, a normalized stress. We take deformation, divide it by the length to get, a, to get a normalized strain. We do that so that we can start to classify how materials behave. And one of the most fundamental pieces of information that can be characteristic about a given material is what's called a stress-strain curve. And basically that results, <coughs> sorry, basically that results from taking a sample of a given material. I actually had a couple in here last time, uh, those, those uh, A505 specimens, those tensile specimens. Take a sample of a given material and take and yank on it and load it until failure. Okay, and what happens is um, these are just some examples of, of different testing materials. For a, a material like concrete, you wouldn't pull it; you'd push on it. Concrete is a material that's very, very uh, strong in compression but pretty weak in tension. That's why we have reinforced concrete. We put rebar where the concrete's going to have tension. Um, but what ends up happening is you get data that looks something like this, and this is the data that is characteristic for a given material <coughs> and, and describes how that material responds under load. And the nice thing about this, this uh, data is there are unique stress-strain curves for individual materials. There, this is a stress-strain curve that is indicative of low carbon steel. This is one of an aluminum alloy. The nice thing about these concepts of stress and strain is I could have tensile specimens that are all different sizes but if they're all the same material and I do my math appropriately, I should arrive at the same result for each one. What we'll do next time is we'll watch a stress strain test so that you all see what's going on and we'll talk about you know, the individual points that you can get on a stress strain curve and what those points mean uh, and why they matter. Okay? That's all I have for you all today. I don't want to get into information overload, so we're going to stop it here and I will see you all next week. So you all have a good weekend.